Hey, my name is Ben Friedman, host of Ben and Brand See a Movie. And I just want to talk about today's episode, which is on video because I have with me Mr. Jeff Snyder. And Jeff was so gracious to join us. I invited him on a few months ago to join us in discussing Wes Anderson's filmography, specifically Moonrise Kingdom, which was a movie I knew he quite enjoyed. And he was so gracious to say yes. Uh, For those of you who do not know who Jeff Snyder is, he is a reporter at The Ankler. He is an editor at Below the Line. He is a columnist at LA Magazine. He is genuinely a great guy. I have been a fan of Mr. Jeff Snyder's for years before getting to do this podcast. He was somebody that I read in college that helped me discover my own writing style in film review. He is somebody that is so honest and I love that about him. He is somebody so willing to just say what is on his mind and not worry what other people think. It's one of the best characteristics you can have when you're doing film criticism because you know it's coming in raw, unfiltered, and it's exactly what you wanna hear when someone is reviewing film criticism. So often we try to sanitize ourselves that it's just so refreshing to hear somebody talk so boldly about this. So I'm really honored to have Jeff on the podcast. We had a really great discussion. Can't wait for you guys to hear it. Like I said, check out Jeff Snyder. He's the in Snyder on Twitter. He has a great website, which I will link below in the description for this podcast and for this video. Gives Jeff some love. Thank you so much for joining me. Check out the insider.blogspot.com. Great resource. I use it all the time. It just helps me find what movies to be watching in the year 2022 because he watches so many movies that I haven't even heard of. So check him out guys and again thank you mr snyder for joining me one more thing before we go into this episode i did just want to make sure it was clear this episode was recorded march 21st which was a few days before we found out the news about bruce willis obviously bruce willis is in moonrise kingdom and while we are very Uh, praising of Bruce Willis. I just want to make sure that when we talk about him and we talk about his career at the time, me and Snyder were not aware of what was going on. That news broke about a week after it recorded. So I did just want to say that, that please do realize that when we discuss Mr. Willis, his career and his role in this movie, we are discussing it about a week before all of that. So much love to Bruce Willis, what he is going through right now. I cannot imagine you are so beloved by many. You are a great actor and you are in the MVP Hall of Fame of the actors. So we thank you for all your work there. But yeah, just wanted to put that preface out there before we started. And with that all said, I'm going to throw it over to myself and Jeff. So thank you guys. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ben and Brand See a Movie presents The Wild Wild West, where we break down all of Wes Anderson's filmography. Joining me today is the one and only Jeff Snyder. Jeff, how are you today? I'm good. I'm, I'm doing better than Bran, I've heard. Yes, Branson is out for a little bit. Uh, he'll be back soon, hopefully, but... Uh, for the time being, Jeff is joining me to co-host this episode. He's no longer a guest. I promoted him as a co-host. Yeah, really. Look at that. I just got a promotion in the last few minutes. Sorry, Bran. It's, it's yeah. now the Ben and Jeff show. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I am really excited to talk to you. I, When I was corresponding with you, I told you when I was in college, the articles that I would read when studying writing, journalism, and all that, you were one of the guys I'd read just because of how influential. And your honesty is just superb. I've never seen a guy who just cuts straight through all the BS and goes for it. Uh, you know, that, that certainly made me abrasive in some corners of the internet, but yeah, like, but there's a lot that I don't know about a lot, but when it comes to watching movies, I'm not going to let someone else, you know, pretend to be the expert. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I've been, I've been doing this a long time, seen a lot of movies and I'm excited to talk about this one with you. Yeah. And speaking of which, I always find it so interesting to talk to my guests to see where their love of movie begins. So where for you does you do you remember like film playing a significant part of your childhood? It's a good question. Um, 
I mean, God, when I, I'd say like well, the earliest movies that I can remember seeing are like an American Tale when I was like really, really young, mm-hmm. and then you'd be like nine, uh, sorry, Nine Inch Nails, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm-hmm. um, and Ghostbusters too. So I would say around like eighty nine, ninety is when yeah. I remember sort of starting to really like movies. But I'd say I fell in love with movies watching horror movies. Mm. That like it was you tell me something that I can't do and I'm gonna try to do it right. That's mm-hmm. just kind of natural uh, human behavior. And so yeah, these super violent, gory horror movies, whether it was Chucky or Freddy or Jason or whatever it was, I mean, you know, it was the perfect time um, for for someone like myself. Like I probably watched Freddy's Dead when I you know like seven or eight years old. Um, and so I just love that stuff. I loved the feeling of being scared. I love scaring my, my younger brothers uh, eventually. And I think that is how I eventually fe- fell in love with movies. I'm sure that made you the popular brother in the household, scaring your brothers. Right. I, I, dude, I was bad. I used to, st- with my youngest brother, Jordan, I used to hide in his closet <laughs> at night and pop out when he was like starting to fall asleep. And I either had a Freddy mask or I'd call myself the Night Stalker, which was like, I don't even know who the Night Stalker was mm. back then, right? It's just like uh. a, a badass name. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I'd say it rubbed off on me in maybe a, a couple of creepy ways. But, uh, you know. Was that all use your avenue horror, but specifically like slasher, like Freddy, Hall- Halloween, uh, Friday the 13th? Was that always your preferred genre within horror, not maybe the mythological versions yes i i I would say so i I definitely gravitated to the slashers and serial killers and and that kind of stuff and i still do to this day i still Mm. you know that's those are the you know i watch the true crime documentaries and i read Mm. crime books and detective fiction and i don't know i've always had that uh dark sensibility i suppose Mm -hmm. which is speaking of which is the reason i ended up seeing x this weekend was because of all the rave reviews i heard from you from perry from really everyone on twitter who i was so i loved it absolutely was just engrossed by it i thought ty west just had such a direct vision with the story and knew exactly what he wanted to do and i thought it was just a fun throwback to kind of the Halloween Friday 13th era of horror, which we don't get. And it was so funny. Just That's the thing. I thought the humor was really good. I thought the kills were really good. And it had some emotion, you know, an emotional undercurrent running beneath it. Yeah, totally agree. I just, Kid Cuddy to me was just so many scenes with him were just so darkly comedic and mixed with Mia Goth. Jenna Ortega is quickly becoming just one of my favorite like scream queens mm. just in the past few years. So yeah, I was truly impressed with it jeff i do want to ask you because what exactly for people who do not know you how do you work in hollywood because you're not a typical film journalist you do a little bit more than that could you explain that i do a little bit of everything i would say like i don't i don't consider myself a critic um Mm. you know i i do perform criticism from time to time um i'm like listen these days, I, I am an editor of Below the Line. I'm a columnist for LA Magazine, and I'm a reporter for The Ankler. So I have those three things going. But traditionally, I've just considered myself like a, a film and television reporter whose job it is is to basically specialize in casting news. Mm-hmm. And one of the cool things about you is you've broken the biggest stories in Hollywood. I mean, from the Star Wars story that you broke last week, where it was, I believe, it was Damon Lindendorf is how you pronounce his name? L- Lindelof. Yeah. Lindelof. Yeah. You broke that story. I know you've broken just so many cool ones. Uh, how stressful is that? Because I'm imagining you're competing against everybody in Hollywood to get that story because everybody wants to publish that. It, it is very stressful. That's why I have no hair here, Ben. <laughs> and the hair that I do have is, is gray. Uh, yeah, it is. It is a very competitive space and, and, and film specifically more so than television. Television, mm-hmm. they're a little bit better behaved. Everyone singing Kumbaya a little bit more. You know, there's like the Television Critics Association or, or you know, and then it's, that's not that's more like reporters and whatnot. But um, yeah, film is the wild, wild west, man. We are vicious. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, we don't really spare each other's feelings. And I mean, listen, at the end of the day, we can still be friends. I'd, I'd like to think um, for the most part. But yeah, when we're out there on the field, you're, you're playing for keeps. You're playing for bragging rights. And, uh, and we go hard. So it, it is very stressful from time to time. Mm. 
yeah, I the the things that you break with the speed because sometimes you see it where you're getting the scoop about like five minutes before another guy tweets it out. So I'm just like sure. every time I'm just like, gosh, that's just like you got to be going so quick. And I know because I have friends who work in the agency as well who they'll be telling me stuff on that. And I'm just like, wow, it's just like, cause I know also you have to play kind, not kind, but you have to play along with the publicist a lot of the time, which is a jo- an aspect of the job that if you've never done that work, you don't know how annoying it can be at times. It's very t- tricky. You have to find the, the, the proper balance and, and you have to walk a fine line because yeah, you want to have a good relationship with these publicists and these companies because not only do you want to, you know, have a good rapport with them, but you want to get invited to the screenings and, and the parties and the events. I mean, th- those are the perks of this job, right? But at the end mm-hmm. of the day, you can't let those perks blind you to what the job is, mm-hmm. which is holding these people accountable and, and, and speaking truth to power. And so, yeah, there are times when you have to, you know, go against a publicist's wishes and say, no, I have this, I- I'm going with it, whether you like it or not, you know, whether someone else is holding, I don't care. This is news and it's happening right mm-hmm. now. Yeah. And, one of the things, but Ben, real quickly, feel feel free to introduce me to some of your young friends in the agencies because I did all the 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 breakfasts and the drinks and all this stuff when I was a young reporter, and now I'm older and and the people my age are making movies, right? They're not mm. they they don't have time to pay attention to everything that's happening, right? Because they're busy with their own projects. So I need to meet these young people, these young assistants and whatnot. So if you know anybody that I should meet, you let me know. I will tell you off air because I get yeah. stuff from them that I don't want to ruin that relationship of course, either. Of course. Off the air. One of the sites that you didn't mention that you work for, and I think it's one of the most valuable movie sites online, is just the Insider uh, blog post. That Thank is, you for saying that. I reference it all of the time because I don't agree with a good chunk of your opinions, maybe <laughs> like 50% of the time. But here's what I will say. When you put a movie in the good slash best of the year category, it automatically hits my radar. I saw Coda. I was planning on seeing it already, but after I was listening to you, others rave about it, that quickly went from, okay, I'm going to watch it before the Oscars to I'm going to make sure I get it done before 2021 ends and absolutely loved it. And With that said, I did not listen to you on The Power of the Dog and absolutely hated it. One of the boringest movies I've ever watched. So slow. It was something, man. It was something. I don't understand the praise for this movie. I'm not going to get into it because I know if it wins Sunday, we always cover the film that wins Best Picture. Right. And I'm just dreading it because I don't want to rewatch it. I promise you, I promise you won't have to. I, I really feel I'm very, very confident in that. You yeah, you don't understand. There's nothing I would rather do than not watch that movie again. I, you know, I I didn't love Moonlight or Parasite. I liked both those movies, mm. but I didn't love either one, but I understood why they won. Agreed. I would not understand why The Power of the Dog wins if it does. It's one of those movies that when people are asking me, like, which one should I seek out this year? I'm never going to recommend The Power of the Dog. I'd only recommend to like the slightest of audience who I can know can deal with that lower, slower, melodramatic Western, all that. And even that is a kind of hard sell. The other ones, it's like I always kind of judge things based on if my mom would watch it with me. And The Power of the Dog is a movie I could never get her to sit through where Coda And West Side Story, those are two really easy ones. Even Dune, even if I don't think she'd like the movie, she'd be in awe of the craft of Dune. Mm -hmm. But just, yeah, Power of the Dog. Just I do the same thing with my parents. There's no way I would have gotten dad to watch Power of the Dog. And if I did get him to watch it, he would have turned it off 20 minutes in. Mm -hmm. Coda was a real struggle to get him to watch. But by the end of it, he, you know, he wasn't like, this is the greatest movie ever. He's like... You know, but he but he liked it, which is like it spoke volumes. Okay, to get for him to even make it through that movie. Yeah, we're in such a bubble where it's just like sometimes it's like you think this is what everybody likes. And then it's just like, no, the films that relate to people are probably more of the line of Coda, West Side Story, those bigger, broader ones. that are just more easily accessible. And I think that's Coda's greatest strength along with just its cast, which is just wonderful. One last question, because I know you're a Boston guy. Are you following the Celtics right now? Of course. Are you loving what you're seeing? 
They're doing great. I mean, I was pretty dispirited halfway through the season. They were like 25 and 25. I was like, this mm. team isn't really going anywhere, but they have caught fire at the right moment. They've got the momentum. Yes, I, I am encouraged for a long, uh, deep playoff run. I got to see your guys play my team Friday, the Sacramento Kings, in oh. a uh, what was an embarrassment for me, but we're tanking, so I really don't care. I really, as long as you guys destroyed us, I was kind of fine. But it was just you guys got something really special with Tatum and Brown. I, to me, people who are saying like, break it up. I do not understand it just yet. Like, I think they are proving themselves like bonafide stars in this league. Yeah. I, I think they're both great too. You, you just don't get rid of two young guys like that. And especially like, you know, they were dangling Ben Simmons. I was like, we were everyone in Boston who I know was like, get out of here with that. We don't want Yeah, that. I did. Simmons, I heard Barnes, my guy Harrison Barnes being traded to your team in like favor of like Marcus Smart. I'm like, why would you do that deal ever if yeah. you're Boston? And you guys had such young success with them already. I think what they took LeBron to the finals at the age of 19 each. Like, right. right. Yeah, chemistry now. They've played together for the last years. I think we got some good big guys. Uh, we should we should give uh, who is it Milwaukee uh, run for their money in Philadelphia. Yeah, and you got rid of Kyrie, which is probably the biggest blessing <laughs> you guys have done in the past three years. Exactly. But anyway, let's jump into Moonrise Kingdom because I cannot delay it any longer. And let me just briefly just give the overview of Moonrise Kingdom, Jeff, if you will indulge me for a few moments. Moonrise Kingdom is directed, of course, by Wes Anderson, written by him and Roman Coppola. It is produced by Wes Anderson. This is one of the uh, this is the first project that Owen Wilson has no involvement in Wes Anderson's filmography in total. Uh, Sorry, I should say at least to this point, the music's done by Alexandra Desplat, and it comes out in May 25th, 2012. It has a budget of 16 million dollars and it grosses 70 million dollars, much more uh, successful than maybe a few of Wes's previous projects with Darjeeling and Life Aquatic. This film comes out to critical praise. It is well beloved and it is a really charming movie. I find it stars Bruce Willis in a role that's very non-typical for Bruce Willis to be taking, especially in the 2010s. The first collaboration he has with Edward Norton, who would go on to star in Grand Budapest Hotel, Isles of Dogs, and have a scene in the French Dispatch. Stars, of course, frequent collaborator Bill Murray, Francis McDormand's in this movie, Tilda Swinton, Jason Schwartzman, and has the introduction of two young stars in Jared Gilman and Kara Hayward. And this film follows those two characters of Sam and Susie leaving their parents and going on a wilderness adventure uh, across, I believe it is, I want to say, is this Massachusetts? I believe yeah, it's New England. New England. Yeah. New England. Yes, you're right. New England. And that's all I need to kind of just get in to start this movie. Jeff, I'll kind of just give my hill to die on, which again, uh, refresher is the my big, bold statement on the movie, my opinion on this movie. I think this is Wes Anderson's most accessible film for movie going audiences. It has the eccentricities of a Wes Anderson movie, but it doesn't go too far off the radar, which sometimes he has the tendency to do, where it's still a very direct, streamlined movie that I think a normal audience can appreciate and understand. And it's also his most restrained movie. We don't have as much set pieces in this film or, uh, you know, houses like or boat designs in a life aquatics case. This is very much a wilderness movie and he's capturing nature uh, and scenic imagery in a very beautiful way. So to me, this is one of his easier movies for an audience member who's like, I want to watch Wes Anderson. Where should I start? I think this one's an easy one to start with. I think you're absolutely right. I think it is accessible. I think it's uh, it's universal. It doesn't really matter what culture you grew up in, what part of the world. I think if you were 12 years old, you had a crush on somebody. Mm. Uh, and it really just captures... I don't know the beauty of, of young love and, and that feeling, um, you know, those butterflies that none of us really know what to do with at that age. Uh, and so I, I just think it's so cute that, you know, we have Sam and Susie and they run off together. Like 
where, you know, extrapolate that. Well, where, where do you, how is Sam going to work to make money to support the two of them? That, that kind of stuff. They, but they, they don't care about that. They just throw caution to the wind and they just want to be together. Mm. Uh, and, and yeah, there's something touching about that. Yeah, I agree. And with that said, I think the element of that relationship that works so well to me is they never, Wes Anderson never just portrays them as kids, like just in love. He gives them the respect to be their own characters and he doesn't talk down to them ever within the film. So it allows these characters to feel completely fleshed out. They just so happen to be 12 year old kids, which I think is a really beautiful story because I think often what happens is there has to be there's a lot of times there's something more to their story or it's really a story focused on the adults looking down on the kids this one is the kids story right it, it's it's from their perspective um yeah i mean there, there's just something very romantic about it maybe it's the dancing to french music on on the beach in your mm. underwear kind of thing mm. uh, I, I think also being a shorter jewish guy <laughs> something about like you know, she looks so much older than him and, and more mature. Uh, and, and he's working so hard to like be, be masculine, you know, um, and, and prove his his worth to her. I don't know. It's it, it, it just it's like it foreshadows what it's going to be like six years later, you know, when they're mm. both 18 and really entering the dating world and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It as somebody who grew up also a young <laughs> Jewish boy. In Cub Scouts, this movie does also feel very familiar where they get some of the eccentricities of Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts down to a T, even with just some of the weird leaders you see in there where you're just like, these are the ones responsible for adult uh, for children. Mm-hmm. And they do that really well. I just want to start this movie where it all begins, where it's these two characters running off and we're slowly introduced to each character the character for me that because I haven't rewatched this movie, this film comes out one in 2012. So I'm I can't 13, believe in a decade, by the way. Yeah, I'm 13 when that movie wow. comes out and I'm seeing it. I remember seeing it in the theaters because this is at the time where I'm now starting to just watch any movie that I'm hearing good reviews on. And my parents never cared what movie I saw. So I was seeing, you know, from G to R, basically just without any. Uh, rebuke and Mm -hmm. this one I remember hearing about in uh, the Sacramento Bee was this movie is really delightful really good and I remember seeing this movie and it's my first real introduction to Wes Anderson Uh, I had seen Fantastic Mr. Fox before but this is I think where I literally learned who Wes Anderson is and why he was a special filmmaker and it also the reason that it sold me is because at this time, Edward Norton is like quickly becoming my favorite actor to watch. I mean, after Fight Club, uh, after I mean, of course, The Incredible Hulk for me as a kid was the, my introduction to him. But just after all those works, I had just seen the movie that he does with Richard Gere, uh, which I'm blanking Primal on the Fear. name of. Yes. Primal Fear. So I'm like getting into him pretty heavily. And this film starts with him and he's my favorite character in the film pretty easily. I, every beat of comedy they do with him in this movie is to me flawless. <laughs> Just from the introduction of him walking. Yes. Uh, it's such a great character introduction with great character beats that gets you the oddness of this character and a little bit of maybe even the just patheticness of this character. This guy who sees himself as a boy scout leader first and then math teacher second, it just gets into this world of like, who is this guy? And it shows you what allows, I guess, Sam to be the character that he is, that he has this relationship with a scout master like this, who is so bizarre. <laughs> um, you know, I went to Jewish summer camp for 12 okay. years and I was a, I was a camp counselor. And so part of me could relate to, to this character a little bit. Um, I think we were very, very different and, and uh, mm. led, led the kids very, very differently. But yeah, there, there's some, I, I, there's always something hilarious about Norton. Like there's, there's this, you know, even in Fight Club, which I, I suppose is a satire anyways, but mm-hmm. like there's something funny about him when he's kicking his own ass in his office spot, uh, in his boss's office or whatever. Um, I, I think Norton is great in this. Uh, would I call him my favorite character? 
he's up there. He's definitely top three. And this is like probably a top three Wes Anderson movie for me, I think. I would agree. This is definitely in my top three. I think for me, it's definitely Royal Tenenbaums and this movie are there. The third one I'd have to think about, it'd probably be Fantastic or Grand Budapest. I was not a fan of French Dispatch. Not no, the slightest. Sl- I hated it. Yeah, not in the slightest. I we're gonna. That's the last film we're talking about. I'm just I'm a dreading it. Guy, though I do like Darjeeling a lot. It's the one movie now I have not seen from him. I'm oh, we're covering it uh, Friday for the show, so I'm like watching Enjoy it this week. Weekend. Shoot me an email. Let me know what you think because you know that one with three brothers. You know I, I love that. Yeah, for sure. I, th- I that's like I said, the one that I haven't been seeing, and it's the one that I've now just been because I've had a few people have told me Darjeeling is the one that like resonates with me emotionally yes out of all of his ones I think so, it is most emotional yeah so i'm really excited to watch that i think that point you make about edward norton being so funny it's also based on who we know edward norton to be as a public figure with maybe some of the stories that we have heard about him and that's not me judging or putting anything on him it's just he has a certain reputation in hollywood for maybe not being the easiest guy to work with. So it's so funny to see him I, being willing to make fun of himself and not necessarily make fun of the persona of Edward Norton himself, but just being able to make his character a joke. It's funny. I, I, Norton definitely did have that reputation, but I don't know that he has it like anymore. I, I, that, that really does seem to have stuck to him. And I think Listen, any, any big star in Hollywood, you're going to uh, you're going to not only want creative control, but they give you creative control to some extent. Mm. Right? You're like the, the, the buck stops with you, even though you're not the director. You, you, you almost start to think, yeah, I just I, I, I understand why he got that reputation, but I don't know if it's deserved anymore. I don't think it is either. And Birdman, to me, kind of represented him acknowledging that past reputation of him and maybe growing above it to a degree, because that's a very self-referential role that he takes in Birdman. Uh, But yeah, he is to me, I just, I, every little decision he makes, it just adds so much to this world. And it's also just maybe one of the last great Bruce Willis performances that we get recently. I mean, I I'm a fan of glass and I think he's, good in the movie but he certainly hasn't delivered that type of performance often definitely in the latter half of his career yeah no he he is really good at it's this is what happens when you step outside your comfort zone and, and you allow yourself to, to play against type uh, with a director whose you know sensibilities you may not have uh, you know had, had the chance to work with before like I, I don't think Bruce Willis has worked with anyone like Wes Anderson really and and uh, Wes gave him something a chance to, to do something different and, and I think it paid off Bruce Willis Die Hard is one of my favorite action movies like I own basically every Bruce Willis film from his TV show Moonlighting up until I think a good die a good day to die hard is when I finally was just like I can't buy every movie he comes out in anymore so you've seen Color of Night then which one is that Color of Night is that the one where his penis is out? Yes. Yes, I have seen it. Uh, I don't remember. Th- I, it's that thing where I just talked about where my parents let me kind of see anything I wanted. So there were just filmmakers, filmographies who I just bought. Bruce Willis was one of them. So I know I've seen it. Uh, I, I can't tell you a detail about it besides that. Just one random exactly. fact about it. Just penis details. Got it. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the only thing that comes off so wrong. That's the only factor of that movie that I remember. I I got done. Rid of Go good... back and watch that one. All right. Cause I, that's a guilty pleasure of mine. Guilty but any... pleasure. Bruce yeah. Will. I'll have to check it out again. What I... I love what this movie starts off with is this relationship because Wes Anderson definitely has a tendency to explore what he knows. And I'd like it when a director gets to make a filmography and movies based on something that he's lived through or knows. And for him, that's troubled childhood slash parents of divorce or parents who are their marriage is on the rocks. And that's something he explores in Royal Tenenbaums and Life Aquatic and this one as well. And what it does for me is it allows us to kind of see Wes Anderson progress as a director from where he starts, where 
I think this one has some of the softer moments in it with the parents. I think maybe even a decade before the character of Francis McDormand's character would have been maybe a little bit harsher and maybe mm-hmm. just a little bit more not evil because I don't think he's ever just truly made an evil mother in a film, but definitely way more cruel. It feels like to the character of Susie. That's not what she is in this movie. And I, I just like to see how that basically from where we get, uh, uh, Oh my gosh, ethylene Tenenbaum in Royal Tenenbaums to where we get to see Francis McDormand perform in there. I think there's a really beautiful arc of you getting to see a director come to terms with maybe not necessarily trauma, but just like growing and just accepting and learning from his past. Sure. And, and that's, that's definitely a through line in his work and, and one that continues in, in Darjeeling, I think, which is, you know, about three boys trying to find their mother. To you, what parts of the Susie Sam relationship do you start connecting the most with? Cause for me, it takes a few scenes for me to really buy into this story that they're going on. And then once I'm sold, I'm sold. And that's always been kind of my tendency with Wes Anderson. It takes me a little bit to get in the world, but once I'm in the world, I'm usually sold. I mean, I, I just love that first moment in the, in like the field where they start unpacking the, the different things that they brought. And, mm. and I think that those objects reveal so much about their characters. Mm. Uh, I love the, the actual like correspondence that they share uh my maybe my favorite scene in the movie is them going through the letters back and forth yeah i have like a framed thing it's in storage because i haven't seen my belongings in two years <laughs> uh where it's the two like two postcards like one from mm. stamp stationery and one and one from Susie's and everything uh geez um i i, I like i would just like blunt sam is too uh when he first sees her you know at the at the play or whatever backstage and um, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I don't know yeah. exactly when, when the moment is, I, I guess, I guess, you know, when she defends him too, right. When she mm-hmm. takes out the scissors and, and, uh, defends him against Redford and the other scouts, uh, you start to, cause like, it's always a little bit kind of more one-sided. I think that he's more, maybe more into her than she's into him, but then, then she proves herself. It's mm-hmm. a girl. He, as an actor, and I want to make sure I get his name right, so I'm pulling it up right now. I had it written down. Uh, Jared Gilman, he is so charismatic for a person who this is his first screen performance. And what I think that I liked about him so much was just what you talk about, that honesty, but just also an ability to, I think, he sometimes he just gets to say Wes Anderson lines. And for some actors, that's a really hard thing to accomplish for him. It kind of just comes through seamlessly. He was a fine for sure. You, you kind of look like. Th- th- <laughs> thank you. I, I uh, thank you. That's the biggest compliment I think I've ever received on the show that I look <laughs> like a 12 year old boy. <laughs> I, he's one of those ones that I was like, right after watching it, I'm like, okay, he has to of jumped out like on screen since and he's definitely been working since but it's just weird that he hasn't been one of those guys that gets picked up because i just figured he'd be a much bigger star no i I think he is one of those cases where it's like right place right time just like perfect look for this character Mm. um you know could he have kept going Sure, maybe he could have gone on to become like a David Krumholtz type or something. Mm. I don't know, but I, I there's something to be said for like these actors who come in and just like crush one movie, their first. Yeah, movie. There's, there's like a purity about them. It's almost like they're not even acting in a way. Uh, like you know, his his first kiss was the actor's actual first kiss, I believe. Mm. Um, uh, Sam's first kiss is Jared's first kiss. So. You know, it, it, I, is it something of a shame that he didn't go on to more? I, I, I suppose. I don't think Kara Hayward has really gone on to that much more either. She's uh, a little bit more television focused now. Right. She, I, know, I know she's done a, a, a bit more than him, but it, it's not like she ever like popped or became some household name. Mm-hmm. Um, they they are just so intrinsically tied to this movie. And I kind of like that about that. It, it definitely has a little bit of specialness, this movie, where it's just like, 
this is they found the perfect actors. They brought them in for one thing. And then it's like, that's their one and done kind of swan song. There is something kind of beautiful to her career when it's just like, I made the perfect movie for me and I don't have to really prove myself ever again because this movie is going to live on. Right. Uh, one of the questions I have for you, uh, Jeff, and it's one that I've been exploring a bunch on this show. And it's this tendency of Wes Anderson to, and I want to be careful with this because I don't think this movie falls into the trap as maybe some of his other ones. He sometimes struggles to write female characters. I find where sometimes I think they become objects to the main protagonist's story. Rosemary Cross from Rushmore, I think falls into that trap a lot, but certainly uh, Inez from Bottle Rocket. Mm -hmm. This film does it a little, I'll start, not even a little. This one does it a lot better, but was there anything in this film that you watched where you're just like, maybe I would have changed some of the decisions or maybe even just like, I don't think this maybe ages as well. No, I, I, I read, you know, so I read up on the Wikipedia and, and that I didn't realize back then that there was some sort of debate around when Sam touches her chest or something like that. Oh. Um, I, I, it's like, what are, what are we doing here, guys? These, these are 12 year old kids. Like everybody's touching everything, you know, like that's, that's no, I, I fumble around not doing anything. So I just I read those arguments though, where it's like, oh, this isn't going to age that well, and I disagreed. The, I had the same feeling, and that was kind of the scene I was remembering because you were a little bit older, obviously, when this movie comes out than I was. That was the biggest topic of discussion on all the parent boards. Really? Oh, yes, boards, okay. all all the parents boards. I remember Sacramento B published like an editorial piece about it, like an opinion piece. I remember seeing stuff in Entertainment Weekly, all this like and I was subscribing to Entertainment Weekly where I was getting the magazine, you know, every week. And I remember that just being the topic of discussion for this movie. And it was one that I'm just like, even as like someone 12, 13, who doesn't have opinion or say or thought in watching, I'm just like, what's the big deal about this seat? Like, I remember like getting it on DVD at Target, watching it and kind of hiding it from watching it from my parents because I knew it had had like such a controversy around it. And I knew they wouldn't care, but I just was like, I don't really want to have this discussion with my parents. And I remember watching the scene and just being like, that's the scene. That's the scene that just right, like causes all the controversy. 12 and 13 year olds are like, you know, God, doing God knows what, you know, yeah, like, like it's this like, is very tame. This is very 1965. Yeah. And it's just like, I think the thing that like drove me crazy was there was somebody for entertainment weekly that I remember reading and I don't recall their name at all. And I didn't even bother to look it up because who knows how they feel about it now, but they basically were accusing Wes Anderson of close to like not child pornography, but like something of that yeah, essence. And I'm just like children or whatever. It's absurd. Listen, uh, cr critics, media people, they all have to stir the pot or whatever. I don't even think that these people believe some of the things that they actually end up writing. Yeah, uh, totally. They can stand by these pieces. Um, yeah, it's just faux outrage. It's disingenuous. I don't think anybody could really be bothered or too upset by that scene. That That is when you start exploring your sexuality when you're 12 years old, when you hit middle school. So I, I just don't expect, like, how, how are we supposed to ignore physical touching and, and sensation and all that stuff when this is a, a movie about young romance? Like, they're yeah, each other out, literally. Totally agree. It's one of those things where it's like, no, that just feels very true to the story. And honestly, had you not had that scene in there, the relationship maybe doesn't feel as special because it doesn't feel as genuine to what 12 to like teenage emotion slash uh, puberty would be like at the time. Critics don't like seeing sex and stuff because it reminds them how little sex they're actually. <laughs> okay. They... <laughs> That, that 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 is my theory. That's why they didn't like this Ben Affleck Anna de Armas movie either. Deep Water, like I still need to see it. Is it worth it to watch? I thought so. Yeah. I, I okay. Mean, it's nothing great. I mean, it's a friggin' Hulu movie, right? But yeah. 
Yeah. I, I don't know what people were expecting. I think it delivers what it would advertise. Yeah. I got to check that one out. I've been meaning to. It's just uh, this controversy when I was rereading about it, because I did look back into it today. It just reminded me so much of some of the discussions we're having on licorice pizza right now. And granted, does. very different types of, I guess, pr- quote unquote, problematic issues in those movies. But like to me, it's just like, yeah, a film's supposed to be problematic. It's supposed to be provocative. Like, you right. don't like, I don't know. It's like, yeah, 1525. That's not like, it's not condoning the relationship. It's ser- It's just sincerely saying like, this is just what the f- happened in the 1970s. If you want a safe space, stay in your bedroom, okay? The, the movie theater is not a safe space for people. Yeah, and it just, it drives me, it drives me crazy when we have these discussions because it's just like, can we not make something provocative or just that challenges audiences anymore? Just going, going back to like the Susie of it all. um, You know, you, you probably brushed up on the Wikipedia like I did or whatnot, but I do think it was interesting that Cara Hayward sort of approached the character like a young Margot Tenenbaum. Like she saw, you know, Margot as this woman with something to hide. Obviously her mother in the movie, Frances McDormand is, is having an, an affair of, or a fling of sorts with uh, Bruce Willis and whatnot. And so this girl, she is ready to become a woman, right? She wants to act like an adult. And, and so she runs off and has this romantic affair with the, with the 12 year old from down the street. Uh, I, I think it makes perfect sense why Susie would do something like this and what she was trying to accomplish with it. Yeah, and it's so funny. I I missed that part in the Wikipedia where she says she bases it off Gwyneth Paltrow, but that was going to be the point I brought up to you. She reminded me so much of a young Gwyneth Paltrow. The eye, the and eye and everything. That's it's the look, and it's I think that's such a great little nod for Wes Anderson, where it's like that's for the fans right there, where it's just like, oh, like this is supposed to remind you a little bit of Royal Tenenbaums, and maybe just subconsciously draw some of those emotions to those characters where it just, it allows that character to feel more lived in and special for me. What do you think, sir, of the choice? Sorry, not the choice. The, the actual filmmaking aspect that Wes Anderson brings into this movie, because I already mentioned it to me, this is a very, what's the word for it? This is a film that doesn't look like quite any other Wes Anderson film solely because it doesn't use these big set pieces. It's almost all entirely shot in nature. Did you think he was able to accomplish that in a really special way? Um, I I think you're absolutely right that it does feel different. I mean, this and I mean, I I don't know, like, oh, you know, with the with the production design of the the Budapest Hotel and then the Indian stuff in Darjeela, like his movies do tend to take on their own personality. I don't think everything mm. looks, there looks the same, even you know, Life Aquatic with with the the, the ocean and everything. Um, you're right though. This is it, they're out in the woods. It it it. it it's like Cubs. It's like a Cub Scout movie, um, and and it's bright and very like yellow is the color that I associate with this movie. Maybe it's the font uh maybe it's the tense mm-hmm. um but i think this movie has a very specific color palette and design that i appreciate um and and it, it, it does feel a little bit more open uh and you know like you can breathe like you're in nature uh as opposed to some of wes's other movies which feel very production design and every little piece of the frame is composed perfectly like, you can't do that in nature right mm-hmm. that's what i love about it is that detail that you mentioned right there where it's just like everything's very open because specifically i think what happens to us after it and you know i'm a fan of grand budapest hotel uh what does specifically seem to come of this movie is we're getting to the point of just such large ensembles with wes where it's just like he packs everybody in it and i still I, I I'm gravitating away from those I've noticed even like Grand Budapest which again I like I noticed it happens a little bit too much and everything's just so specific with the set design and every little detail and making everything so eccentric and lived in that I'm just like maybe he loses a little bit of the story that was personally like I said Grand Budapest maybe has hints of it French Dispatch I'm just like this is somebody who wasn't told no and needed huh. an editor to just say no, this is not a good idea. Right. 
Moonrise to me kind of represents this nice transition point where we're getting to see a little bit of a larger ensemble cast with him with a little bit even bigger famous actors than maybe typically uh, seen. But it's also the nice reminiscence of, I think, some of his earlier films like Rushmore, Bottle Rocket, where it's just a very small scale story. Right. It is a smaller story. I feel like he, he, you know, Royal Tenenbaums was a fairly, you know, big name cast with Ben Stiller and Gene Hackman and whatnot. Um, but you're right. It, as his career has progressed, the, the cast just get bigger and bigger and starry and starrier. And I don't know that that necessarily, I think it sometimes does a disservice to him. I think he sometimes leans on the cast a little bit too much um, as he did with French Dispatch. And, and it sort of takes the focus away from his creativity. Yeah, totally agree. And I just, it's, sure. Yeah, it's, the actors become a crutch. Yeah, it's just it's some things where I just noticed where I think this is a really nice middle point where you're getting some of the earlier small scale storytelling of Wes with a little bit bigger of the maybe cast list. Again, you're right, Royal Tenenbaums and Steve Zissou certainly have it. It just doesn't feel like maybe this is the first time because it's like, oh, Bruce Willis is in a movie and it just doesn't feel like Bruce Willis would have done this movie 10 years earlier right? in his career. That's the... Uh, point that I was uh, bringing up with that specifically. Uh, I really like Bruce Willis's character in this movie. And that's, I, I say that basically about most of the characters in this movie that I really like this. To me, this is such an emotional story that he gets to have with this boy, Sam. One of my favorite just little moments that the two characters have is where Bruce Willis just gives him a beer, just lets him sip on right. the beer. It's just like, that's a really just simple dad and son relationship just bond right there where every uh most people who have a dad have had that moment in their life and it's just like yeah right just- not at 12 though and i and i like that that he's like doesn't really know what to do with this kid but he knows that like yeah father you know is supposed to introduce his his kid to beer or whatever um and you know it just felt to me like a guy who has never really dealt with kids that much um all of a sudden finds himself having to take care of a kid and i, and I love you know the end of this movie too um where he's like you can come live with me i mean mm-hmm. I, that is really uh uh emotional and and, and it feels earned as well Agreed. And were you not one of those kids who was drinking beer at 12 from their parents? The parents no, them I, sip on a beer. I, I actually wasn't. Uh, really? And, and I don't really like to drink now. I'm not I'm just not a big drinker. And fortunately, mm. my, my dad wasn't either. Uh, I think my grandfather was a big drinker. So that's why dad wasn't and, and why we aren't either. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a big drinker either. I do specifically, though, remembering, I think by the age of 12, you know, I had had that moment of just like sipping a beer mm-hmm. with my dad, like in Mexico. I probably go on family it's, vacation. It out. It's yeah, I don't I didn't particularly like the taste. I'm not a beer guy at all. Mm-hmm. Give me give me soda any day of the week. Yes. Uh, <laughs> here's the interesting part of this movie where I the parts of this movie that I've always struggled with watching it. And I've had some of these same issues is if there was one criticism I'd have to this movie, I think the character of Mr. and Mrs. Bishop are a little underwritten. I think the sure. point more specifically with uh, Bill Murray's character, he doesn't feel like he gets to do a lot besides be the husband that's being cheated on. I think right. I wanted maybe just one more scene of just like him talking to his daughter just to maybe close that because there, I think Frances McDormand gets that. She gets that in the bathtub when she's cleaning up Susie, I think that's the moment that solidifies that relationship to me. Uh, Mr. Bishop's character. I just, I never had that moment with him where I'm just like, I wanted something a little bit more from this relationship. Yeah, no, I think that those are both uh, fair. That's the problem with, you know, big ensemble movie. Um, Not everyone's going to get, equal screen time or, you know, someone's going to end up getting the shaft a little bit. And this isn't like a terribly long movie. You know, I I probably would have watched it for another half an hour, but Wes's movies, I feel like he has a pretty good sense of pacing and and, uh, running times. Like, I think it would be really easy, easy for him to make an indulgent movie, but I don't know. He keeps things moving. Uh, But yeah, you know, given, given the size of the cast here, I think that yes, some people are just going to get a little shortchanged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I it's, of characters though that just get to pop in my favorite maybe just cameo in this movie jason Schwartzman. just i forgot he was in this movie and when he comes in as cousin ben to me that was just again just a scene where a character just gets to come in 
he gets to shine for a few minutes and then he just gets to leave the film without anything else. What Jason Schwartzman's character does in this movie, it's again, just perfect comedic timing. And obviously it's based on the fact that Schwartzman and Wes Anderson have this working relationship uh, that allows that to be this special. But yeah, I was just, he was the aspect of the movie. I just forgot that was in it. I'm just like, how did I forget this? He's so good in this movie. There is a certain cartoonishness to this movie that I actually do quite appreciate. I like that it takes a little bit more of this whimsical feel, like the scene where the kids are getting struck by lightning. When I was re-watching it, the, what it felt like to me is it felt like Wes Anderson almost doing like the adventures of Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer. Where it's mm-hmm. just these two kind of this imaginary, not imaginary world, but just kind of this playful world where these characters go on these really weird exotic journeys together. And it's just like they they each meet certain characters throughout. That's what I really liked about the storytelling in this film, where it's just like I liked how like just breezy it is. It's just like you get scenes in the film throughout where it's just like beat by beat by beat, where it's just it's really easy to watch. I did. I did like those theatrical uh, flourishes, those sort of creative flights of fancy that, that you're talking about, like the lightning and whatnot. It feels, it gives it kind of like a homemade feel, um, almost like uh, Jason Schwartzman's plays in Rushmore. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's great call. Yeah, it it it, it reminds me of that a, a little bit. Mm. Yeah. No. I. It's 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 moments like that where I just think the world is so easily lived in, and it just it feels nostalgic in those moments where it does just kind of feel like uh, not a kid's story, but it just a story made for just young adults. It feels very nostalgic. Like that feels like a beat where it's just like, Oh yeah. My friend got struck by lightning and they blew up like all that. And the, like the books that she reads, right. The children, the children's books that Susie brings with her like that, I think, you know, conjures helps conjure that feeling of nostalgia. Um, The old records, you know, that she's, Mm into um just like the some of the fashion in the film as well um it it it, this movie's from another time even though it like when i read today that it was set in 65 i was almost taken aback because i felt like this could almost be a very modern movie albeit someplace where like you know in a part of new england that maybe hasn't caught up with the rest of you know, modern times or something like, or the, the, the Island people, the people who live down on Cape Cod year round. Mm-hmm. No, agree. It does feel like if you were to just say this film was shot in 2012, there doesn't feel like any beats that are like, Oh, this is like overly like 1960s in style. Right. So I, I, I do appreciate it because it gives it a timeless feel to it. Jeff going on, on our show right now, we have a tournament where it's a 64 man tournament, March madness style we have 64 Wes Anderson characters uh, in this tournament, all battling out to determine who is the best Wes Anderson movie. Your uh, this episode is going to come out a little bit later in the uh, tournament, so I don't I don't have a specific matchup for you, but I do just want to ask. I know for a fact one, Sam and Susie are now destined to meet in round two. They both won round one pretty easily. Who are you voting for? From all the Wes Anderson characters, holy no, God. specifically for Sam versus Susie. That matchup, who do you get to the Sam. sweet 16? Sam. You get Sam, yeah. Okay, I'm leaning towards Susie, but okay. it, it's like 50, 51, 49 for me. I, I, it was pretty cool. I, I did randomization for first eight were selected, the bottom eight were random, and it just happened to be that Sam and Susie were going to meet up in the second round. But yeah, uh, is there any character in Moonrise Kingdom that you believe could maybe make a strong run, even like doesn't matter the matchup, just this character that you feel like has a really strong contention that just like you think the fans are going to gravitate towards them? Snoopy? (laughs) (laughs) Snoopy Uh, is not in the tournament. Honestly, I, I don't think so. You don't? I, I don't I don't necessarily think so. I feel like um yeah I because I, 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 I don't know which character would be Ed Norton's. I mean it, could, it, could it be social services? Yeah, to me right now, it's Ed Norton has maybe the most logical sense. I think it's a fun film. It's also really the only Ed Norton role within Wes Anderson that got like 
I think his character in Grand Budapest and Isle of Dogs is on there, but there's such miniature it, roles within it. You, you know who it is? Okay, I know who it is. For this okay, who? You know who it is? It's probably Bob Balaban. Can I tell you something shocking? Hmm. He is not in the tournament. I mean, that's fair. He's the narrator. Like, he, he doesn't... You don't really know much about him, right? He's narrating uh, the else's story. But when I think about, like, there's something about a narrator that is very Wes Anderson and to see him you know, physically embodied, right? Because there's a narrator in Royal Tenenbaums, right? Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin, yeah. We don't see him, right? We never see him. And right. I think same so, with Fantastic. Right. So to have a, a, a an actual narrator who, who looks very distinct in the way that he's framed as well at the bottom of, of the frames and stuff, I feel like that may be the character who I pluck out of this movie and like put him in the Wes Anderson Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I think Ed Norton has that justification just solely because I could see fans just voting towards him where it's just like, well, this is the one film he's being representative. This is the one that we're going to vote him in. He has this weird matchup at the first round where he's being he's facing Rosemary Cross from Rushmore, which Mm -hmm. is a. So that's a weird one to get over because I actually feel like she could make it uh, fairly far. But yeah, there's no Eli Cash in this movie, Ben. There's no Eli Cash. There is no Eli Cash. There is no Royal Tenenbaum. There's not even a uh, zero in this film. Uh, Before we go uh, and finish our wrap up our discussion on Moonrise Kingdom, I always ask my guests favorite scene in the movie, just point blank. Favorite scene in the movie. It's probably something involving Redford and the scouts. Um, Is it that opening scene? I, I'm tempted to say the opening scene, too. I'm not going. With, although, I although this, the, see, I love Jason Schwartzman. So that cousin <sighs> ben stuff yeah. is also really good. The cousin Ben stuff. The marriage Ooh. scene is so funny. Yeah. Like so underratedly funny in like Wes Anderson's career. I'm, I might have to go with that initial walk through through Camp Ivanhoe uh, with the scouts and everything and just getting the lay of the land and, and seeing the different, you know, h- how they live, who these kids are. I don't know. I had a blast with that. Yeah, it's a great scene. I am going the scene where it's the letters back and forth. <laughs> I think it's just my favorite moment in the film. And it's one that I just I, I think solidifies both those characters for me. Uh, Jeff, that is our discussion on Moonrise Kingdom. Before we get to our debate question, was there anything you want to mention before uh, we wrap up this on Moonrise? Hmm. It's the floor is all yours. I don't I don't think so. I, I just uh, I, I think a big part of this movie is going to be like, you know, when you when you first see it. So you were a little bit younger Um and, and so maybe it had, you know, more, more of an impact. Um, but I, I feel like, I don't know. I, I was 10 years older than you and, and it, it worked its terms on me. It took me back to my, my middle school days. And uh, yeah, I, I just think it, there's, there is something very special about it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because for me, I was their age when I'm watching this movie. So for me, it's not even that like kind of feeling of nostalgia when I'm rewatching this movie. It's just simply like, Oh yeah. Like I remember this, like I, when I watched this movie, I was living through this. Right. This is, this is me now. Yeah. So that's like a definitely like a cool thing to see in this movie. And with that, guys, we are wrapping up our discussion on Moonrise Kingdom and leading to my favorite part of the show, which we call the great debate. And this is where I have a question prep for Jeff. Jeff, I uh, did you prep a question for me? I didn't. I may have forgotten that part. I do know. Do I'm good at coming up with questions. That's my job. So. <laughs> Give give me the lay of the land one more time. So the great debate is I have a question prep for you. uh, And the guest has a question. We go out, we duke it, and we find out who has the better answer. We'll get responses back. Uh, Usually it's never me. So So this is a question that I, that I have an answer to already, or is like, here's how I'll lay it out. I'll just give you my question. So you have an idea. All right. My question for you is name a actor and an actress who have not worked with Wes Anderson that I you did would like that. to see. I did uh, do that. Okay. <laughs> In fact, I wrote it down. <laughs> okay. Name okay, name an actor and actress. So I'm I'm answering this or I'm or we're just where I'm asking you or or oh, I see, I see. This is just your question to Yeah, me. this is my question. I have an answer for it as well, but I'll All let right. you start off with because you prepared this. 
I have a few. Okay, go for it because I have a few as well. The first one, I'm gonna I'm gonna have Tom Cruise switching Andersons, switching from Paul Thomas Anderson <laughs> Magnolia to coming into and to, to do a Wes Anderson movie. I would love to see Tom Cruise, and I would love to see Jake Gyllenhaal as well. Mm, Jake Gyllenhaal. Jake Gyllenhaal is a great pull. I think he would get it like Norton would. I agree. Female wise. It's a, it was a little bit trickier, but I mean, I, I really do think Nicole Kidman is a great actress and, and it would be interesting to see her in a Wes Anderson movie because she hasn't mm. worked with him, right? I feel like he's worked with everybody but Nicole Kidman, right? Nicole Kidman is not in a Wes Anderson film because she's not in Darjeeling. Yeah, I went through the list. I can't think of a single yeah. one unless she's a voice actress in like Fantastic. So Fox. yeah, Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman with maybe Jake Gyllenhaal. And then if I had to do like a character actor, I love Shea Wiggum. And I think Shea Wiggum w- would slot perfectly into Wes Anderson's universe. Mm-hmm. Are you are you pitching a movie where Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman reunite? That would be epic. Are that would guys, be epic. By the way, I didn't even realize that I had said <laughs> kids and they were married once. It's just the mind of Snyder. That. Um, wow. Uh, I, I, it's so weird. I don't even think of them as like a couple. It's um, And yet they were one of our most famous. Uh, yeah. It's, now I have a question for you, huh? Yes. I'll answer the question as well. The one that I just offered. I had a few names. Uh, specifically, I think for female, you have a... I would like to see Anne Hathaway yep. take that kind of leap. I think she could do it really well. Uh, I love Kristen Stewart. I think she has kind of that tone and vibe that I think would suit a Wes Anderson film very well. And uh, finally, I would have uh, Viola Davis is just the name that I'm just like, I just love when I see an actor or actress do something that I'm just not accustomed to. And I think she would be a really weird, fun addition to it. And we get to show comedy which i think viola davis is really good at but doesn't get to showcase a lot and for actor answers what was that those are good answers oh thank you and for actor i have uh chu one of them being uh my gosh why am i blanking on his name right now i'll, I'll have to come back to him oh bill Hader. yes hey you would be great Bill Hader, I think, just has that same kind of eccentricities that would suit them so well. I'd love to see Ben Stiller return. I, I, it saddens me that Chas Tenenbaum is his only role within a Wes Anderson film because I, it's one of my favorites. Uh, but the number one answer to me has to be Nicolas Cage. Cage. Okay. Nick, no, yeah. You, you won this assignment. You did better than <laughs> I thought your answers were great. I mean, you're reuniting two of Hollywood's most powerful couple to quote Scott Mance, iconic, put them together. I, I love it. Uh, also, just a quick shout out. Simon Rex is another guy. I just watched uh, Red Rocket last yeah, week. He was really good in that. He's really good in that movie. So that is my answer. Jeff, do you have your question? I do. I do. Have All right, question. sir. Okay, it's a two part question. Two parter. If. Who would you, okay, if Wes okay. is going to direct a movie, right, who would you like to see write the screenplay? And vice versa, if Wes Anderson was only going to write a movie, who would you like to see direct that movie? Oh, freak, that's a great question. So who do I want to see write a screenplay for Wes Anderson? You know what? I'm going to embrace the code of love for a second. Uh, you're going to have to pronounce her name for me. Is it CM Hater? Uh, uh, Sian Hater or Sian Hater. I loved what she did with Coda, and I think there's a vibe of Coda that kind of gets to touch on some of that young, just personal feeling to it. That I think there's a partnership there that would work really well. And I also specifically want to go female because I have had a few criticisms with how Wes Anderson writes female characters. I'd like to see a female in there and kind of bring their input. Greta Gerwig could also be another really good answer yep. uh, for that. Uh, in I would terms of Greta Gerwig as well. And in terms of director, so this is Wes is writing the screenplay for a director. Right. So Wes has written a script, but he's like, ah, I really don't want to direct. I got to take a year off from directing. Who am I giving the script to to make it? God, that's a really tough question. Uh, 
You know, I'm going to go and I don't think this would actually be my answer, but this is just the name that occurred in the mind because I was thinking of movies where I think they're beautifully directed, but maybe the director isn't being told no right now. And mm -hmm. just they're just kind of getting to self-indulge themselves. I saw Malcolm and Marie about a month or two ago, probably actually longer at this point. That movie is so beautifully shot and so self-indulgent. Just the whole monologue of 15 minutes of uh, Washington just yelling about critics. I just I was so put off by scenes like that, that I would like to see Sam Levinson continue to direct a movie, but maybe have someone come in to rein him back on maybe some of his tendencies. So I'd like to see what Wes Anderson can do with a Sam Levinson uh, as a director. I like it. Do you have a name for a director that you'd like to see? Are you going David Fincher? I thought about it. I didn't, but I. No, I don't think I'd want to see David Fincher directing a Wes Anderson movie. Um... You don't want to see a serial killer just that's doing everything really tidy. <laughs> Did you ever see the SNL Wes Anderson parody? Yes, that one's so well done. So yeah. funny. Uh, geez, who would I want to see direct a Wes Anderson movie? Part of me is thinking Noah Baumbach, but part of me thinks that's like a little too easy. Yeah, with the fact that he did Life Aquatic and Fantastic. Yeah. Um, shit. Wes Anderson. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Do you don't know? So you do. You, so let me ask you this: Do you want to see him ever do a horror film? Like Wes do, like. Scream six, maybe not that film, but something like that. A Halloween, anything like that. You don't want to see Wes Anderson work in that slasher genre. No, I think of Wes Anderson as a comedy guy. Um, and I don't need him to be making like Judd Apatow movies or whatever, but mm. I, I think I'd like to, you know, get a good natured movie, you know, like once he once or every other year from him. Um, I don't I don't need him to do a full like Oscar bait drama or even genre horror or anything like mm. that. That's fair. I there is a part of me that would be curious to see what a Wes Anderson horror film looks like. Uh, I I threw out Scream just solely because I'm like, I wasn't the hugest fan of the recent Scream movie. And I'm like, OK, maybe they could uh, inject actual comedy, which I thought was at times lacking yes, in this newest one where I'm like, I thought maybe Wes Anderson, but I agree overall, I don't think I'd actually want to see it. It's one of those weird like thought assignments you think of. And then the, the more you think about it, you're like, I don't actually want to see that. Yeah. But I, I fully agree. The one name that I could not remember, Jeff, that I, I did remember is John C. Riley. I'd love to see John C. Riley work with uh, Wes. Are you watching Showtime right now? Yeah. Uh, winning Time. They winning Time. Winning Time. Yes. it's. Uh, I've seen eight episodes. It's great. Oh, okay. You saw all eight. I am on... I th is it being released weekly or is it out it's, all? Yeah, no, it's it's weekly. And I think that there's 10. So I haven't seen the whole show yet, but it, it's really very good. Yeah. OK, I'm on episode two or three right now, and I'm definitely liking this more than I've liked some of the other Adam McKay's recent projects. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that all said, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I just want to give you a second to plug anything that you would like to, anything that you're working on, anything that you just want the people to know about. Um, if you're an Academy voter, vote for Coda. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm writing for the Ankler these days. If, if you guys have some spare uh, pocket change, please consider getting a, a subscription. We just dropped the news of when you'll be able to see the Avatar 2 trailer. Um, BTLnews.com, that's where that's the day job below the line. You'll see all kinds of fun interviews with artisans and, and the craftsmen who, who make all these movies that we love. And then, uh, my, my column over on LA Magazine, the Hollywood Heat Index, where I chronicle who's hot and who's not each week in the town. That's about it. The insider on Twitter. Thanks, guys. And yeah. Blogspot.com, which is a great resource. Thank you, Ben. That's really one of the nicest compliments I've heard because um, I do put, I try to keep it very up to date. I keep it very meticulous and I'm glad that you noticed and appreciate it. Listen, when I'm doing my own on my own website, I do the same thing on into the where I'm just like, I'm ranking it. And then when I was designing it like a year ago, I'm like, God damn it. I just stole Jeff's exact format. So I was just like, I was changing it around a little bit. But just it's like, a weird format. People, first of all, you got letterbox these days. Everybody's rating on a five star system, which it's is group think. It would have Roger Ebert rolling in his grave. Okay. 
So I, I still do four stars. And I know that I, you know, categorize it into like standouts and good and guilty pleasures. And, you know, Drew McWeeny, who's probably one of my favorite critics, brilliant guy, ha- hates the term guilty pleasures, hates that I would feel guilty about liking a movie. And, and but, but it's like, listen, this is just, you know, this is the system that works for me. And that and Blogspot is a system that works for me. Yeah, I agree. How ridiculous I, I, I sound with a Blogspot address. I probably sound like I'm 60 years old, but I, I it works for me and it helps me keep everything organized. No, I totally agree. And guilty pleasure is that weird term because I have that same one where I was like, I had last year. I actually, for some reason, enjoyed the Addison Ray movie. He's all that. I'm like yep. one of the 10 who probably did enjoy that movie. And yep. the only one that was above the age of 18 in male. But that was the thing where I'm like ranking and I'm like, okay. And people got pissed when I made my every film I watched in 2021. And I had that like 30 spots above power of the dog and uh, right. don't look up. People, people were livid at me. People don't understand how, the way the rankings work. Uh, you know, it's, it's like preferential. I liked this Ben Affleck movie. Right. But I'm not going to call it a good movie. I, yeah. I, I know enough to know, okay, this is probably not a good movie, but I like it. So it's guilty pleasure. That's yeah. I'm it. going to rewatch this movie again, but I can admit that Jane Campion directed a better movie than power with power of the dog, mm-hmm. but I'm going to watch. these all that about a hundred times before I ever choose to watch power of the dog. This is a pa- This is becoming a power of the dog, like hate manifesto for me. So I should probably cut it off, but <laughs> time, exactly. We'll back away from the laptop. Yes. So that's where I'll add uh, one last plug that I have to give it to you because I friend Scott Mance has also been on this show. FYC uh, for your consideration on Perry Nimroff's channel, just had an episode yes. today, which uh, I still have to watch. I have it on cue. Great show. Love the show. If you're Very- an Oscar fan, I think I'm wearing the same shirt. So yes, I, I taped it on the same <laughs> day, guys. Um, and yeah, we have an episode coming out on Wednesday. That'll be our final prediction. So be sure to tune in. Perfect. And uh, with that all said, uh, my name is Ben from the Beniverse here at Ben and Brand See a Movie. Thank you for joining me, Jeff. I hope to have you back sometime in the future. When, and- you, when, you, do, when you do Fincher or Tarantino, you give me a call. I already did seven, but I will keep you in mind for when we do Zodiac. Okay, yeah, that that, yeah. that, that sounds No, weird. actually, you know, I, I know you're a Mank fan. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are listening to audio, Jeff just flipped me off. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jeff, for joining me. You've been awesome. Uh, guys, thank you for following. Follow me on the Metaverse. You know where I'm at. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.